afternoon. I'm Jia Min and this is Eric. And today we'll be sharing with you lessons from Singapore's water story. So, um, Singapore has faced different priorities and challenges in its water journey. And the first of its, um, and the first priority that Singapore had to tackle when it was independent was moving from water scarcity to water security. And I'm going to tell you now, how did one of the world's most water stressed countries become a thriving global city? So Singapore has four national taps, water from our local catchment, imported water from Malaysia, new water, and desalinated water. So most countries will pay attention to the water cycle, which is this um, outer circle over here. And in Singapore, we have extra, uh, two extra sources of water, which allow us to achieve water security. So both of um, these sources of water will allow us to provide more water to the population and industries. So new water um, uses treated used water in order to produce potable water and desalination uh, uses water from the sea in order to provide water for the population and industry. In Singapore, um, Singapore produces a land use plan every five years and this is our land use plan in 2011. And as you can notice, there is a green um, nature catchment, sorry, central catchment reserve in this area and these are the rivers that are flowing um, through it. And even though this um, central catchment nature reserve is gazetted under the Parks and Trees Act, its position is actually rather fragile because as you can see, um, rather close to the uh, nature reserve, there are residential um, buildings and even today there are continued debates on whether we should um, have plans for transport on top or below this nature reserve. Despite the, despite Singapore's um, gazetting of nature reserves under the Parks and Trees Act, um, Singapore has had uh, problems with insufficient catchment water. Even uh, from its founding until the 1960s, we faced water shortages so serious that we had to have water rationing even near the areas where there were uh, water catchments, as you can see in this picture. At the same time, um, we also had a night soil carrier system where, um, our, where residents would have their human waste um, collected by a night soil carrier and sometimes the residents would also, um, because of this informal system, they would also um, dispose of their human waste in less improper, in less proper methods such as putting them into our freshwater streams and uh, rivers. And um, the Water Pollution Control and Drainage Act, as well as the waterborne fee, um, allowed for sewage to be handled um, through a waterborne means rather than this night soil carrier system, allowing us to have a fresh water supply that is unpolluted by human waste. Yeah. So in Singapore, um, this picture shows the different uh, rivers and the different industries that are near these rivers. Yeah, because of the stresses that are placed on our land, we have um, things like pig farms near our rivers, we have um, street hawkers um, at the, near the Singapore River, and all these contributed to a polluted water system. And the idea was that um, our then Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew decided that we had to clean up our rivers and seal it off from the rest of the sea in order to have a fresh water reservoir and that we can use for our daily needs. So this was the Singapore River before the cleanup. And after the cleanup, um, it has become a, a thriving, uh, a river in the midst of our busy city that is clean. Before the cleanup, the Kalang River had drowned pigs in it, uh, scooped up during the cleanup because there were pig farms near the river. But now um, there's a peaceful and harmonious coexistence between the river, um, the residents, and the students of the buildings nearby. The next challenge that Singapore sought to um, manage was to manage the journey from water security to water management. So Singapore was uh, facing um, 
more intense storms more frequently due to climate change, as you can see here. And at the same time, we are facing rapid um, urbanization, which led to increased concretization. So instead of water being absorbed into the ground, water was um, running off from the concrete uh, more quickly, leading to flash floods. So to manage, oh, sorry, uh, this is the area of Singapore that you may be familiar with. This is called the Gulong Park. And um, this is the junction between Scotts and Patterson Roads and on Orchard Road in Singapore. This is the same junction that was flooded in 2010 after the completion of Ion Orchard. Yeah, due to increased concretization, um, there has been the increase of floods um, that Singaporeans have been experiencing. And to combat these, um, to manage our storm water better, um, we, Singapore came up with the ABC Waters Program. So the ABC Waters Program has three aims, to create active, beautiful and clean waters. Active meaning that the community has ownership over our waters. Beautiful meaning that um, our reservoirs and waterways are aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing, even if they are um, commercial development. And yeah. And last, um, we also have. We lastly, we hope that the waters will also be clean. So there's the scientific and engineering element where we improve the water quality by incorporating green features. And secondly, the public education element where we minimize pollution. So let's take a look at some of the ABC waters in practice. So first, um, Bishan Amokyo Park. Um, this was actually designed in the 80s, uh, where you had public housing on the side here, and you had the park here. You see the green fencing to keep people away from the water, and a concretized canal which will allow water to flow faster away from the estate. Um, in the 2000s, the National Parks Board, which owns the park, as well as DUP, which owns the canal, actually got together and decided that they will redesign this park as an ABC water to Im implement natural features such as a natural floodplain as well as na a natural filtration system at the site. So you can see this is how it works during a high tide, uh, high rainfall period. It's a natural floodplain that can actually capture water as well as filter water from the river banks. <clears throat> so this is how nature plays its part in the ABC's water program. So the newer model is the integrated model in like Pongo Waterway part of the Pongo 21 project where you can have the river, the wetlands at the side, a public park as well as public housing together as one in a harmonious living relationship between nature and humanity. Um, as an, a great success story of the ABC's water is actually the story of the Bishan and Marina otters. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, Singapore thought that its otter population were extinct. However, after the the creation of the ABC's water project, otters started reappearing in the Singapore island. So um, in 10 years, we have actually seen our otter population increase from zero all the way to 50 across um, our Singapore River as well as the Kalang River. Um, they have been so well um, recognized that the national newspaper in Singapore, Straits Times, is really actually chose the vision of otters to represent Singapore in its 51st year above and over all the other national symbols of Singapore, which shows that they are really well-loved in Singapore. However, there is still a small minority of people who, due to illegal fishing activities, um, they actually have injured our authors quite a few times before by using hooks in rivers where they are not supposed to, um, according to PUD regulation, which actually harms our authors, unfortunately. Um, so now, let's explore how Singapore has moved on from water management to inculcate ownership of the water by its citizens. So first, uh, MacRitchie Reservoir, you see Water Wally, created to uh, appeal to school growing children to conserve water and to keep our waters clean, such as using a mark when they brush their teeth, as well as to pick up litter at and around our rivers. Um, next, Kalang River, you see some of our school children here who are actually conducting a water testing exercise with our Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong, showing how they take ownership of our water and try to learn about how clean our water is and how to maintain it that way. Lower Salita Reservoir, um, the Game Fish and Aquatic Rehabilitation Society, actually an uh, NGO in Singapore, actually conducts sustainable fishing clinics in Singapore where they use um, bait that does not pollute the river as well as a catch and release system to ensure that the population of aquatic animals inside the river is maintained. However still, there is still a problem. The Singapore River has, has seen constant trash in the river every year after major events such as 
Ki Laneway Festival in 2014. So you can see all the floating trash all over the river. What is interesting in Singapore is that our government has actually funded and helped set up the Waterways Watch Society to maintain the cleanliness of the Singapore River, which was painstakingly cleaned up in the 70s and 80s with funding from the Ministry of Environment. So here they are conducting a cleanup operation. Um, this boat was partially funded by the government as well, if I'm not wrong. Um, however, this is not the way, however, in other countries, a more robust manner of um, uh, securing and enforcing rights to water and the rivers have surfaced, such as the Wanganui River in New Zealand, in which after more than a century of legal uh, fighting, they have officially in the New Zealand Parliament declared it as a legal person with all the rights and duties as though it was a company, which is um, a great step in success for the local Maori community along the river. In other places, like the Ganges River in India, the High Court actually stated that because of extraordinary situation of pollution at the river Ganges, they actually took the extraordinary measure of declaring it an actual person, partially due to its religious status as the mother of India in the Hindu religion. So you can see the difference in the legal cultures of India and New Zealand as opposed to Singapore. I, my theory is that this is actually a manifestation of the red and green light theory in which Singapore's legal and judicial culture actually reflects the green light theory of consensus instead of conflict. This turns out in our industrial relations as well with our tripartite system where the public sector, the private sector and the people sector all work together to resolve labour conflicts rather than to bring their cases to court and in acrimonious dispute. This is actually opposed to other legal and judicial culture which adopt the red light theory where the courts are the first line of defence against administrative abuses of power such as the Wanganui case. This actually might be a good reason why a different approach that Singapore takes in river protection and restoration and I submit that this might actually be a better way if the government is willing to listen to the people as well as the private sector to work together to secure a better future for our rivers. So this is a Singapore success story for you and these are our acknowledgements. Thank you.